Welcome to the Religica podcast at the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University, where we explore core themes around the values that shape our lives each day. This is Michael Retrice, Director and Spare Halligan Professor at the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. And today I have the real pleasure of speaking with Maya Baumgartner, who is the manager of Spiritual Care and Well-Being and the Joy in the Workplace Project at the University of Washington Medical Center. Welcome, Maya. Hi. Good to be here. Really, really glad you're with us. The reason, listener, for our meeting today is that we both have a book that we think is astoundingly good we want you to know about. It's called Compassionomics, the Revolutionary Scientific Evidence that Caring Makes a Difference. Who would have thought? (laughs) <laughs> you needed a multi-year study on <laughs> care, compassion. Hey, let me tell you. You know? <laughs> it's helpful right? in and making in the, the case. Yes. And in this society, like, you know, maybe we need a little bit of a kind of reminder of this. The book is by Stephen Trezak, we think, and Anthony Mazzarelli, two physician scientists who uncover the eye-opening data that compassion could be a wonder drug for the 21st century. Mindful that the book was written in 2019 before the pandemic, so... Mm-hmm. What's interesting is that what we're reading actually doesn't feel that dated to Mm-mm. me. No. You know? And it's got a forward for the listener by Senator Cory Booker, U.S. Senator to New Jersey, which I think became a state, third state of the union in 1787. So fun fact, people. One third of all Americans, it suggests, do not consider compassion for others to be among their core values, according to the study by Darley and Batson in what year? 1973. Mm. Huh. And I would say that that seems to be bearing itself out, in fact, in some quarters of our population today in the U.S. Mm. I mean, is compassion a core value? I mean, it seems like nationally and internationally to have its trends up and down, right? Yeah. But that's a good question because sometimes I think as a society, we're like, what do we want our kids to be? We want them to go to school, to get be successful, get a job, go to college, learn yeah. stuff so that they can be okay, right? Yeah, and right. it's not necessarily- Join the machine, you know? Yeah, it's, we don't necessarily have that same, what I want to say, mantra for compassion necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it doesn't seem to be like a revenue generator, you know, like, <laughs> oh, what am I going to do with that? It's like well, I did a BA in philosophy and my father said, terrific. That's going to help a lot with your business career. <laughs> well, that's a really good point, not being a revenue generator, because it's really important to take a look at that because oh. healthcare runs on such thin margins, at least hospitals do. And as a spiritual care provider in healthcare, we're not billable. And so always making a case for ourselves. It seems pretty profane at first to say you have to kind of connect to the bottom line, but this book did connect compassion to the bottom line. And he writes it in as a lit review for doctors especially, which tend to be the leaders in healthcare and also require the sort of research. I work in an academic medical center, research, it's all about research. Every every time I've talked about meditation, I've had to kind of bring it in a research, before meditation became cool, let's Mm, say, in the last five years. The whole yoga search. Yeah. Before it became more something that everybody was like, oh, we know this helps us, you know, and could understand the parasympathetic nervous system Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Really, like 10 or 15 years ago when I was doing it, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance or with Fred Hutch, Mm -hmm. with all the doctors that are PhDs, you know. And that's a major cancer research facility, nationally and internationally reputable, right? They Mm -hmm. do all kinds of amazing, incredible work. Yeah. And have found cures for certain kinds of cancer, haven't they? Yeah. And they were major in the stem cell transplant Mm. stuff for bone marrow transplant, being kind of leaders in that. And so if we were sitting down for meditation or if I was making a case to do meditation, I would have to bring in the science. And one time, one of my core stories is that I was leading one of the teams in talking about resilience, and I opened with a loving kindness meditation, and I said, and here's the benefits. Before Mm -hmm. we do this, Mm -hmm. go ahead and do it. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's all right. You know, just breathe through it. You'll still find benefit. And I talked about lowering your pulse rate, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end... One of the doctors, you're right, my pulse rate lowered. And I thought, well, that's great. And then maybe next 
time since you know that's going to happen and you believe it now. Maybe next time, you know, you might experience it even in a different fullness. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, that's what's so, I mean, that's fascinating, what's so as well fascinating as well about this is we know that according to statistics in this book, that somewhere between 28 and 40 physicians will take their own lives per every 100,000, mm. which is a staggering number in the U.S. alone. This sense of isolation that happens yes. when you're not connected. And and I think maybe to your point, I want to ask you about this. For the whole book, the Compassionomics is not about simply showing kindness toward others. It's much more kind of integrated habitus. It's a kind of practice of one's being every day so that what's different from, say, compassion is empathy. And we talk a lot about that, like mm-hmm. having a, a high emotional IQ or a high Empathy IQ and like, that's fine, says this book, but compassion is more integrated in your life. It's more of a, of an art form of care, which takes a level of cognitive commitment, but also like interrelational commitment. And action. And it's action, really right. About, I mean, that's over the last 10 years, there's been just a lot more research in this area in self-compassion with Kristen Neff's work and then in compassion. And and so you'll see in research and you notice in this book that he has to kind of delve through the differing definitions. But really where we are now in research, we talk about empathy as feeling with somebody and noticing that there's pain. And so you might feel that a little sense of pain when you're having empathy. And that really is in your pain center of your brain. But when we move towards compassion and action, thinking, oh, I want to do something, I can do something in this moment, and taking compassion and action, that moves to the reward center of our brain. And so so that's how they're different. Going back to your first point, the pain center of the brain, which is is like the size of an almond, right? This very small area, if I have this correct, it's the magdala you know, I... <laughs> Magadella? Macaroon? I'm not going to be that. Yeah, I can't remember I'm either. Because there's a, a number of, of yep. little points, so I just sure. refer to it generally, to be totally honest. Cause... No, that's great. But what you're helping me, th- there is a connection, though, with inflammation. Yes. Yeah. Like where you have that pain that is chronic mm. and unresolved creates inflammation in the body. And that this book is suggesting... To your point, and I'd love to hear you say more, that compassion actually has a way of helping us deal with suffering and pain and has a physiological impact on inflammation. Mm. Well, it can move us to that. It increases our vagal tone. It moves us to that parasympathetic branch of our nervous system, which is rest, digest. It's the place where you have the wider view of things rather than this really focused immediate. When we see threat, we're kind of in that pain center oh, place yeah. too. Yeah. And so they have found that loneliness is inflammatory. And when we talk about compassion, we're always talking about a sense of common humanity or meaningful connection. I mean, that really is the difference of feeling that aloneness to feeling meaningful compassion is a real, really, again, moves us to that reward center and is more sustainable. The loneliness is not sustainable, to your point, and to the book. Like, it, it really becomes deteriorative, doesn't mm. it, to our health? Yeah. High blood pressure goes up. We talked about diabetes increases. There's other kinds of impacts of sustained chronic loneliness. Mm. And then to this other point about how essential compassion is, one of the items it notes is the question as a core question is, does compassion matter. And the book is saying, as listeners you're hearing, yes, it matters. Empathy, if it's only a feeling or a whim or a disposition, compassion has feet, right? Like it walks, (laughs) you know, it has agency. Mm -hmm. It wants to be activated. So what do you think about the fact that it's not a core value in society? When we know it has health implications physically, it has relational implications that draw tighter, stronger connections. It has a way of providing emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical healing. What's our resistance about? Yeah, it has. And like he says, better outcomes in medical care, better yeah. compliance with the procedures or the, I mean, patients are will actually do what more motivated yeah. to help themselves. Yeah. And, and we are, as humans, more motivated to care for ourselves. So 
your question is, what do I think of that? That compassion isn't a value or as isn't much? it ironic mm. and even tragic in a society that doesn't value compassion? What's our problem, people? <laughs> we should be showing more compassion and living longer, I think is one of the conclusions of the text. Yeah. It's sustainable for ourselves and for our own well being, but I don't know that our well being is I think our society is so connected to pushing product or, you know, like is a capitalist system. Yeah. And so there's much more individualism in a capitalist system than than some of the systems that are more community based or even, you know, there's better parts of our system that do care for others where we do say we're going to give a little bit of ourselves or our care to society and make sure that there's some safety net. But that isn't necessarily our economic system. It's not, in fact, more of a corrective of it. Yeah, usually. it's like it's. I think so you're absolutely that's right. That's a little hard to push against. It absolutely you know? is, and and you're reminding me of a section of the book. It's before we get to chapter three, where it says that a, a lack of compassion can be learned. Now, this is interesting, reader too. And I think Maya and I we've been talking about this text and why it's important. But but think about this in your own work environment, whether you're a physician or a nurse or a nurse practitioner. No matter where you've been trained in whatever field, whether that be in a for-profit, in industry, or in a distribution center, or as a a physician, or say a nurse, or a teacher, the book talks about what a hidden curriculum is, which is to this point that which Mm -hmm. kind of keeps us separate from one another and highlights the desperado, like the individual, Hmm. the one who has to learn and compete. And like there's healthy kinds of competition, but part of the hidden curriculum is the supposition that the technical means or response by which you get ahead is to find yourself always in opposition Mm. to something Mm. else rather than finding yourself in associated relationships. And I don't know about you, but I've been in work environments where the hidden curriculum may not always feel so hidden Mm. and it's meant Mm -hmm. to create less kind of viscosity between people, less kinds of relationship. One, you asked also why compassion might not be our highest value. And I think one piece is how much in a hurry we seem to fit everything in. In healthcare, there's actually a lot of financial things tied to time. Okay, Visits of doctors have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. A lot of that can be run by insurance companies of how, how much you're paid back, all that kind of thing. And and that can, I don't know, I think that's some of it. Sometimes we feel like we have to get, I think that's personally when I'm the least compassionate is when I think I'm in a hurry, yeah. too, when I just can't yeah. find. And, and a lot of that is just not having presence, not you know, thinking too far, things I have to do and feeling that pressure, that overwhelm. And I can imagine, I think that just got amped up, especially during COVID too. Mm -hmm. There were just so many things to do and so many external pressures as our society gets more connected with one another as well. We just see more and more distress. And so we do feel, I think some of that sense of overwhelm was some of it, overwhelm and hurry. And that really leads into that study that you appreciated so much that you told me before this podcast of, of the seminarians at Princeton. Well, yeah, and this is one of those, you know, the listener may know about this, but at Princeton Theological Seminary, I mean, this is decades back, there was this particular study on compassion. And for those of you who are familiar with the narrative of the Good Samaritan, the story goes like this, and you can find this across religious and kind of philosophical literature that, you know, you find someone who's really in an imperiled situation, and you're in a position to help them, and some people walk by. And the third person comes up and says, how can I help you? Let me give you some a little bit of money, maybe a little food and water, some shelter. And then the moral after that is, huh, how about the nature of compassion? So clearly we're talking about something that's a core value in our humanity because it shows up in all of these sacred texts that go back right. millennia. Yeah, all the wisdom traditions. All these wisdoms, like beautiful prose in many of these traditions, you know, like the book of Job is one of them, like in the Hebrew scriptures. Check that out if you haven't, haven't read it. So. I appreciate you mentioning this because the Princeton Theological Seminary has this study and they have two groups of students and one group is given – the intervention group, we could call it – is given a story of this Good Samaritan, okay? And then they're asked to go actually give a presentation, maybe even a homily or sermon on the story. Yeah, they have to go do some kind of errand or they have to run – I thought they had to like run across campus right. to do something. Yeah, like it's urgent. That's your point, right? right? You're and, in a hurry. And half of them were told you're in a hurry and the other half were told – 
just do this, but you, you take as much time as you yeah, want. Yeah, have a snack, you know, you want to sit down, <laughs> but no rush. But I think it's a wonderful illustration of your point. So the, what they discovered is— So um, there was an imposter. Right. So they had this, like, ploy, like the duck in the water, you know, that's sitting out there acting like he's hurt and mm-hmm. needs some help. And what they discovered is that even though this intervention group had read the story— and were on their way to do something with the story, they didn't show any more compassion than the control group, which was like next to nil. I mean, I think I, I think you have to go back and look, and a part of me is a little hyperbole for the viewer, but in effect, they all but one, I think, actually stopped to help this person. I think, didn't they have, <laughs> this is great, we should, I should have read this right beforehand. Cause... It's fascinating <laughs> narrative, right? Because, but the people who had more likelihood in that subgroup, the people who were said, don't hurry, you have were more likely to re- take the time to reach out. That's the other one, right? Yeah. That's the other conclusion. Like that group, unhurried to your point, help more. Those that had read the moral narrative of being good to others in a hurried state found themselves right. appealing to that hidden curriculum, right? <laughs> You're just, <laughs> this value matters, yeah, but wow. it's not like... Super important when I'm in a rush and I'm being otherwise held up. That's a really interesting reflection upon how strong culture is. I mean, our wisdom tradition is one culture, but also where we're living in and who we're living amongst and and is another culture as well. Yeah. So you can see them kind of in competition. <laughs> And one loses out over the other a little bit. It reminds me of, if I can just say this, a couple of years back on a larger street next to a grocery store during the holidays in uh, December, mm. there was a, a woman who was clearly asking for, she was kind of standing out there asking for some change and could you spare a few dollars? And she was a young mom and she had her son with her, who also, it seemed he had a learning disability. We spoke at one point. And, I mean, she was juggling a lot in that moment. There was a tremendous amount of need in that moment that people could see. And for those people who may have grown up in conditions where you recognize that need, Mm. maybe that's something inside of compassion that does help. Mm -hmm. The moral narrative may not get you there because it's Mm -hmm. just a story for some. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you can connect with the human life and with the experience you think you're seeing, even before you talk to them, we all know that feeling, right? It draws you toward people Mm -hmm. to help. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, there's this other side of the story where people rush into danger. Like mm-hmm. there are times when you are drawn to the assistance of others. Mm-hmm. But this book makes a clear case that if you don't have compassion, what do you think happens? To you? Yeah. And to the other. Well, the other clearly doesn't have the benefit of kind of getting re-regulated or having some healing sense. But for our own selves, we burn out. I mean, we yeah. really burn out. And we think that increased compassion, he made a nice point of you think that it's compassion and fatigue, which has been kind of, we talk about more about traumatic stress now than compassion fatigue. But yeah. but that's still an umbrella and a common term that people are familiar with. But it doesn't mean that you run out of compassion. It's just that you have so much compassion that you just ran out and got burned out. What they have found with a lot of these studies is that it really is an inverse relationship. I mean, you have the lower your compassion, the higher your burnout really is kind of a predictor. And the higher your compassion is self-protective of burnout often. What do you make of this case study in the book where you have someone who says, yeah, for a long time, the emphasis was get in touch with yourself, do yoga, go for a hike, right? But Mm. actually what I need is more care Mm -hmm. for myself, for others, and from others. Yeah. I need connection. I need a network. Yeah, well, I think that's the that's that cycle from you you see some pain and you move towards feeling like you can do something. So it gives you some purpose, some meaning, some worth, and so you get a sense of that warm glow, which gives you enough energy to go back and do it again. Now, I mean, granted, <laughs> there's there's a time when 
I think we kind of shut ourselves off from that cycle. And it's because we're getting overwhelmed or we numb ourselves to seeing other people's pain or we feel hopeless. What happens, especially when there's so many people in need, you might feel helpless, like I can't do anything. And one thing that we work with in the hospital is that, yeah, you might not be able to cure them or this person might not be able to physically get better. But you did something. And this is where the spiritual part comes in that I think the spiritual traditions get, Mm. is that if you're with someone, your presence made their day a little better. You can loving kindness meditation. You can wish them well. You can any of those kind of reach out. Tonglen in the Buddhist tradition as a wonderful taking on the pain and sending back love or, you know, just having this relationship and this real active, it's kind of an active compassion meditation I think they'll show up in a lot of wisdom traditions, but it's an action. And and even if you feel so helpless, like when we're grieving the death of a loved one, we were like, I don't know what to do. Or a friend we know has someone who, who's died. And we might not know the person who died, but we know our friend. And we're like, I don't know what to say. But we know that maybe if we just are with them and offer our presence, that there's some balm in that. And we kind of know that by our experience rather than trying to fix them and say, well, at least this. <laughs> or we do stuff and that, that shows the connection and that that lifts their burden or helps them feel that common humanity. And I think that's, again, that common humanity link is what pulls us from that loneliness, that inflammation, that sent a lot of those, just the distress. For the listener on – because you're going to have to go out and buy this book. I really recommend it. On page 71, it's in the third chapter that just exemplifies the point Maya just made. I'm just going to read like maybe six sentences. In another interesting and elegant study from the same group – you have to read it to find out where the group is. The researchers found that during experimentally induced pain, the compassionate touch of a trusted other results in physiological coupling. Here's what that means. The cardiovascular system and respiratory system of the trusted other literally gets in sync with the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system of the one receiving the painful stimulus. This also works contravalently, I guess, with regard to care. The researchers found that there is a coupling of both the heart rates and the respiratory rates of the two people, a synchronous harmony of the heartbeats and breathing that mirrors each other. Their autonomic nervous systems actually align. Even the brain waves mirror each other further. It is in this physiological coupling that the effect of compassionate touch on pain reduction occurs. In fact, the research showed that compassionate response from a trusted other was only effective if touch occurred. Mm. Touch matters, too. Wow. Yeah. And think of COVID, what that did to just healthy accompaniment. I mean, to your point, you know, I know you've done a lot of work on trauma. In COVID, we spent a significant amount of time separated from one another. And I think we've we've really underappreciated how much that impacts our humanity, the impact that has on our kids in this endemic of Mm -hmm. mental health crisis. I mean, this is the assumption that touch is not as important, is being challenged by a book that was written before the pandemic Hmm. Mm -hmm. by a year, but still before. And Kristen Neff will talk also about how you can, I mean, that helps us regulate. You can help regulate someone else that way and help by getting in sync with them. But you can also put your hand on your own forearm or your heart and think about how that helps us regulate ourselves if we have that capacity in that moment. But it is so yeah. nice to have, to be have a community sometimes to bear that when you do not feel like you can do it for yourself. And for ourselves, you know, there's a section of the book too about compassion for oneself that is the key, right, mm-hmm. to this, I think. And and that part of it was really important. And I think all of us understand that sense of complementarity is one way of putting it, but this sense that what we need from ourselves is also a significant amount of understanding. And I think it was in chapter 10 on, as you named it, the kind of compassion as an antidote to burnout, where one of the important ways of addressing burnout is to actually care for oneself. Yeah. Well, right. And and to be aware, really, it's just this, it's the same cycle. Just as we're, we're aware of someone's suffering, we want to do something about it, we do something about it, we feel a warm glow, we go from that pain of awareness, of suffering, to action. We need to do that with ourselves. And I think 
it's a bit countercultural sometimes to say, oh, wait, I am suffering. I mean, especially for a stoic, kind of a stoic sort of background or a background that's always used to helping others and not themselves. Healthcare folks are great at that or helping professions. But to to stop and pause to say, oh, I'm suffering. Uh, Okay, I can wait. I'm not alone in that. It's sort of a company learning that we have the capacity to come be ourselves and then saying something kind to ourselves like, you'll. I'll get through this or I've gotten through this before or yeah. I know that I'll be okay. You know, to be able to to know that we have the capacity for that can counteract all – think of just all the negative – our negative self-talk is <laughs> – it, it's probably goes on so much in people, I know for me, just to be aware of when yeah. it's happening. Yeah. It's been like a tape going for 40, yeah. 50 years. So to turn that off can be, or to even notice that it's happening and go, oh, there you are. <laughs> right. Maybe you can. I recognize you. Yeah, you yeah. recognize you. And not push it away, but make friends with it and go, I, you're not as helpful to me as you yeah. were before. You know, you, you have been helpful in times when I was maybe not making the right decision to cross the street when I was three, you know. <laughs> yeah. But right now, why? you go over there and I think I'll, I'll I think I'm good you know and so we can kind of those are two elements that I find to be really really helpful to help retrain ourselves because it takes it takes a long time to set, reset our default I think oh I think you're absolutely well, right some of the about studies that. said Tanya Sanger had a study that he quoted in here of a six hour intervention did help people kind of reset their sense of pain when they saw or their sense of threat when they saw certain pictures or whatever, they were able to kind of move more quickly towards compassion than stay in the pain. But I don't know. I think that our first reaction is often is often just to avoid. So So let me just like, to your point, I'm just going to kind of walk alongside here. I want the listener to just think about what you've heard Maya say and consider this, that burnout isn't just about exhaustion, right? There's something else happening there. It's one of the reasons why we have to have essential relationships to the workplace. But on, on page 292, it says, okay, well, here are some of the characteristics of burnout. See if you're experiencing these. Mm. Hypercritical of yourself or others. Desensitized from your context or your situation. You know, just caring less. Apathy. Feeling empty. Disengagement. Hopelessness. Pulling away emotionally. like, And even acting out at home, mm-hmm. in ourselves, in our own kind of internal script, as you're mentioning, or at work. All of those are actually not just I'm having a bad day. They can really be taken together as features of something deeper down around Mm -hmm. burnout. And then to your point, there's something about the toxic nature of regret in ourselves. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have done that differently. Man, I should have handled that Mm -hmm. in another way. Or, oh, I remember that event 40 years ago or whatever it was, you know, in the late 18th century where I shouldn't have, (laughs) you know, done that. Right? I mean, it's so long ago. No one, no one even remembers but you, and you'll take it to the grave, right? Why? Because, I don't know, did yeah. you feel embarrassed? Did you feel humiliated? Did you feel small and diminished? And the perpetuation of that, decades of that, would burn anybody out. Yeah, it's legion. It is legion, yeah. right? And that, to me, you know, <laughs> the fear of self-compassion is actually, Paul Gilbert wrote, some scales of the fear of self-compassion, fear of compassion for others, and compassion from others. And when you read those lists of what those are, I don't deserve it, or I wouldn't know where to start, oh, or yeah. I'll lose my edge. Oh, interesting. You know, which is totally an acceptable understanding in our culture. Is like, and it's understandable because we we say, I want to learn from this. I want to figure out what's wrong and correct it. It's sort of our our way of improvement. And... If we spend a lot of time woulda, shoulda, coulding and having the shame or having all that, what they found, so those can be some barriers to self-compassion. It's really good to know what our barriers are to compassion for others, from others, and self-compassion. But what they what they found is they there was a study, and I don't know, I don't think he mentioned it in this book, but there was a study of young adult women runner, um, athletes. And they did some compassion meditation education as well and some compassion training, if you will. And they wanted to see if it hurt their outcomes or hurt their ability to run or whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. They found that the people who had that intervention actually did better. However, when they interviewed them afterwards, the 
young women said they didn't feel like it did help because they want to keep improving, right? I mean, that's how strong our cultural, like the science actually said, this actually helped you because you didn't, who knows what the mechanism was, but they they probably were really focused and centered, et cetera, and that might have helped their performance. Mm-hmm. But they didn't think that it did because it's such a strong cultural value. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of barriers to even to even being convinced that self-compassion is not going to be indulgent or waste our time or help us lose our edge. You're reminding me that there is a conversation happening right now in for-profit culture where compassion is being reintroduced as a core value or maybe Mm -hmm. just introduced. Like, yeah, we have to be compassionate. We have to show empathy. You know, let's do this. And at the same time, in nonprofit industries, so hospitals, many of which are nonprofit but not all, there's also for-profit, ministry settings, religious organizations and such, where they're devaluing empathy and talking instead about compassion. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they're doing it is because those – Helping industries on the other side of the pandemic are experiencing tremendous overflow of leader burnout. Yeah. And you see this too, don't you? In your, I mean, without attribution to anyone, mm-hmm. in your field, what does burnout look like right now in the hospital on the other side of, I shouldn't say the other side of the pandemic entirely, but, but where we are in this pandemic. Yeah, age. we haven't had a surge for a year. And I think this is pretty generalizable. But if you think of how much trauma, it it means another, I think healthcare and helping professions, we're witnessing other people's trauma. So we always have a bit of secondary trauma just hanging out with us. We always have a level of moral distress when we see (laughs) in our work and, and grief, et cetera. But I think what I feel like has been so hard to live through and to see is just that, that there's a, just a, in our society, too, is this really reactive state. I mean, I think that's what it looks like, is that people have just been at their ends. I mean, there's just no extra bit to push, to cope, et cetera. And so I think it's wise to start thinking about how can we Mm. share compassion, figure out ways that people can support one another, and that people can find some of that at work or that feels like this is a compassionate culture Mm -hmm. because... (laughs) Because you can only push through that so long. And I think that during just three long years of pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to be heroes and then being seen as and then having people honestly kind of there's increased workplace violence in hospitals now, too. So there's a just because everybody's on edge, not. Between families, I mean, everyone who walks in is on edge. And I think that we're really working hard to attend to that, at least in my workplace. There's resources given to having more response teams for things that are bubbling up and doing more training and being able to to attend to that and not feel like, oh, I have to take this because – I'm trying to help this person, even though, <laughs> even though this this part is really dangerous. You know, I don't know if that's I'm getting into the weeds there. No, but you're doing. This is really interesting. I think that we're continuing to grow this culture of peer support, and and that if you do have an event or a situation to be individually or or have the group debriefing culture, mm. we have a number in I know in in healthcare in general, there's EDI or DEI, but there's if there's been a like diversity equity de- inclusion yeah diversity okay. equity inclusion debrief if there we also have debriefs for grief for moral distress and for events that include not just talking about what went right and wrong in the event but also we kind of follow that up with some how are you doing and give some education but also we find that in those moments that often when people talk about an event that they thought could have gone better not everybody can see everything that went on. And so we have these beautiful moments with senior leaders or sometimes this person, this nurse or this doctor had more information than this one did. And so you see compassion kind of connecting as people go, oh, that's why that was so yeah. hard for you. Because I walked away and I was fine with it. Yeah. But now I see why your service or you three people in particular carried the pain because you also knew what the family was going through mm. at that time or you didn't know that this was the proto, you know, like there's some deep, beautiful understanding. And when that happens, I just, 
I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time. Because people who normally wouldn't have this, they might just talk about the logistics of how can we improve this process. But they open up and they say, this was painful. And, And there's just a lot of beautiful support you know, with that and, and a lot of ability to follow up to later. So we're trying to, I think, I think healthcare systems are trying to create that debriefing culture, that ability to call a peer who's been through it, their first death or been through mm. this situation. They just say, yep, even if a person after an event that happens, which is a really kind of <laughs> horrible way of saying, after there's been an unfortunate I don't know. Like someone's died. Someone's died. Someone's... Yeah. After after there's been yeah death or a code or something else yeah. that just seems like it went a little bit wonky mm-hmm. or that it was just so morally distressing because maybe this patient was so young and yeah. had walked in with a different story and yeah. all of a sudden there was just um you know whatever the the tragedy if there's a sense of tragedy around it yeah what we want to get is people to say let's get together and process yeah. this because we're going to be we're going to have be able to share that common humanity, and that will help us move through this faster so that I can – I'm not just shutting myself down to get on to the next patient, which happens. Yeah. You know, like, oh, okay, got that. Yeah. You know, let's move on, and I'm not going to process anything. And I say, yeah. you know, you don't always have time to process it, but – you can, but make an appointment with yourself to process it. So that debrief culture is, uh, in some ways, it's code for slow down. Yeah, let's stop and have a pause. Yeah. And that's interesting because that's another thing that spiritual care kind of brings to, this isn't a spiritual care commercial, but um, <laughs> but that's another thing that I've seen nurses and spiritual care people do is, I, in fact, I saw a doctor lead it recently in, in the ED, and I was really impressed because at the end of a code, which was very tough, tragic code um, where a person died, very tragically, the ED doc just gathered his team and he said, okay, we're going to just pause. Mm. And this person lost their life. Mm -hmm. I just want to say you guys did everything you can, but we want to think about this person, what they brought to this world and their family. And also, I just want to thank you. You know, let's just take a moment to just honor this Mm -hmm. life. And that's one thing we encourage people that, that this compassion like this takes time, but often that 30 seconds or 40 seconds, like they said in the book, has a lot to do with people bringing their humanity to work and feeling like they're not just machines trying to push through this, you know, and can kind of cure some of that numbness that can build up. In the book, it notes that 70 percent of people experience a feel-good sensation when giving meaningful help to others in need, that compassion for others can overcome distress associated with seeing other people in distress. So it actually has kind of a not a toughening impact, but it's ironic, right? By virtue of helping others, you are also addressing your own perhaps I don't know, existential resistance where you feel vulnerable. Well, we feel vulnerable when we're feeling compassion, but it's real and it's authentic. And then the other is that there is a higher compassion associated with lower depression symptoms. Yeah, and anxiety too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you have a higher yeah. sense of personal accomplishment or maybe enhanced quality of life, it might be that you're actually serving others in some very unique ways and yourself where you would say, oh, I don't have time to be compassionate in that way, but actually. So this reminds me, I want to, I want to give you another example. There's a colleague of mine whose child is like many kids today in this generation questioning nonconformity around gender identity. And, you know, this child has said pretty clearly, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, this is a challenge for me and uh, it's a challenge for the whole generation. I'm trying to think about what gender identity is. I know for many that may feel somewhat complicated, but you know, what is gender identity different from, say, my physiological identity from being born? So like I'm born mm. male or I'm born mm-hmm. female, you know, but then like, well, okay, how do I how do I associate my gender, which feels more like a social construct? So I'm going too far into this, <laughs> but that's not what this podcast is about. But you. you got my point, right? <laughs> and a lot of this is for the listener, right? You got my point. Okay, so moving on, here's here's the point. This kid made claims about their gender and had another member of the family, this is all going to sound familiar to a lot of people, who takes huge issue with this whole conversation, right? Mm. Okay, so they fundamentally disagree on how to understand this, and there's that's a, a, an entirely different conversation. What, what I want to say is when it came to the core fiber of their relationship where the issues were secondary, even – 
even how I understand my fundamental kind of relationship to my identity in terms of gender, that this was a relationship between two family members who discovered a way to still continue to care for one another and demonstrated that visibly. The little things that I would be told, you know, there's kind of touch on the shoulder or reflecting together. Yeah, it takes a big heart to be able to do that. Everyone has to lean in when you know there are fundamental issues we don't agree on. But what's the alternative? Not just for that family, but what's the alternative for society where we might disagree with a lot and in fact do now and it's pretty distressing. But if we were to disagree on the core fundamental value of compassion, what would that mean for us? <laughs> I mean, that's just, lo- you know, ga- game over, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a chaos, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's like, you know, it's like the glue that holds it together. And really when we're always talking about, like you, you speak well there of, you know, those divisions that we have, whether they're sports teams, divisions, political divisions, divisions on even some really specific, I don't even know if I would call that values, but identities, being able to find that fiber, that connection, that we have some common humanity. In the in the Tibetan or the Buddhist love and kindness meditation and in a number of meditations, when you practice them, you practice this compassion not only for yourself or for a loved one, but for Somebody's kind of neutral. And then you practice on maybe somebody it might be Mm. it really difficult for Mm. and try to find. And and one of the meditations is just like me, just like me. This person also wants to be loved, has people who love them. Uh, Just like me, they want to be filled with joy, Mm -hmm. free from suffering and at peace, you know. Mm -hmm. And so... Even though I have nothing in common with this person or right now it hurts so much to be near them, I can do this action that's kind of more on the spiritual side. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember a person, a Sufi in town, Jamal Rahman, said, you know, if we can't heal stuff here on the earth right now, at least let's make an effort spiritually. So how do I connect with that person by saying, just like me, they also feel something that I've felt or have hopes that I've had as a way of just claiming some common ground or practicing. You know, yeah. it might feel fake at first. That's what practices are. We do them with other people, and they it might be a little script at first, but then after a while, you open up the space. Mm-hmm. feels like it gets to that, the beloved community, you know, a sense that we're, that it's not a, we're not special, it's uh, that we're all <laughs> part of, we're all in this together. This also has practical application, maybe a few final words on the book, to not just the value of compassion, but the norms that guide our everyday life, whether that be in ourselves, in our family, or even in our team at work. There have to be norms. One of those norms might be everyone on the team matters. Everyone's mm. a creative contributor. We know that the truth arrives in dialogue. I mean, some of that may sound especially like, you know, 50,000 foot esoteric, like, well, okay, that's fine. But, but in truth... People want to feel like they can care and be cared toward and that their contributions matter. And that could be on an assembly line, in a workstation, in our homes. These are some fundamental needs that that make organisms healthier, whether it be us or the team we work in. Yeah. And as an organism, we need to kind of just move towards, like you said, lean in towards ourselves or towards our community. And I don't think everybody's going to, it's not about getting it perfect. It's about having some practices or having some community that helps us reorient when we're, when we've, we're starting to avoid or isolate or when we do feel that separation. What do you think about the practice as you think about Mm -hmm. this in your own field? And as we're looking, as you've read this book and think, you know, practice, yes, Orientation, yes. Leaning in, yes. It's not easy. No. And and I think that's why, I mean, the wisdom communities tend to have some practices and other people doing them. I feel like some of those wisdom traditions now are being borne out in some of the science. And you see especially yeah. loving kindness meditation being highlighted. I think it's simple, easy, and it kind of moves, you know, a lot of traditions have some version of it. You know, you and I both have a background in theology, among other things. And mm. I read recently a report that those fields that make the lowest amount of income <laughs> <laughs> are those who receive like a BA in theology, like whatever you do, 
There's lots to do, <laughs> but don't do that. And But it just seems a little, I mean, this isn't self-congratulatory toward the field, right? But it does feel like what we're learning, perhaps, in the midst of the exhaustion that we're experiencing, if we really look deep, is that there are some core truths that are cross-cultural, across religious and philosophical, and that are like buttresses or moorings that are driven deep into the earth and that are like a part of the ways in which we cross bridges to get to one another and build connections and compassion is one of them. And it's healing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love this word compassionomics of it. <laughs> I know that was clever. Right? The yeah. interior, like, this is how it works. This is the kind of well, modalities, right? And we might be we might be lured into thinking that talking about it is actually going to change anything in us, but it won't. I mean, the science really does hold true that it's actually, I mean, that was a, a control group for one of the studies that they did was they said, okay, this group did nothing. This group talked about compassion and learned about it. And this group actually practiced. And the group that practiced that's where their brain and the neuro, all of those things change. That's yeah. where they move through that pain center faster and move towards compassion because they think I can do something. And that's where they had that story of the Buddhist monk who, whose hippocampus was larger, yeah, you know, because he's done so much compassion meditation or compassion had such a focus on it that actually his brain looked different. Physically, like you could yeah. see it under... Uh, MRI, yeah. right? Yeah. And they found that, yes, his process always started with that pain of noticing suffering. You have that, but he moved so quickly. And I think that people who are kind of, I don't know, I think I think people who deal in compassion um, <laughs> will feel seen in this, you yeah. know. And it's kind of neat to see uh, a lit review on this or to see it also. These are two doctors that have talked about it. So it's kind of nice to see that, see that linked and see the important kind of importance raised raised to that level mm. of physiological psychological and even even just full on even good outcomes and full well-being so yeah i think what happens what's good for the individual is good for the society so i am with maya baumgartner and we are reading together compassionomics the revolutionary scientific evidence that caring makes a difference pick up the book it's worth a read And it's particularly worth a read with a friend and a colleague where you get to reflect on many of these main themes for your own life, for your life with others, and also for society. Thanks, Maya, so much for this interview today. Welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you for listening to the Religica.org podcast at Seattle University. For updates on educational events, resources, or opportunities, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Religica or visit our website at seattleu.edu forward slash the center.